Are you ready for part? What part are we? Four? Regardless, it is time. It was a quarter past six when we left Baker Street, and it was still wanting ten minutes to the hour when we found ourselves in Serpentine Avenue. It was already dusk, and the lamps were just being lighted as we paced up and down in front of Brioni Lodge, waiting for the coming of its occupant. The house was just such as I had pictured it from Sherlock Holmes' succinct description, but the locality appeared to be less private than I expected. On the contrary, for a small street in a quiet neighborhood, it was remarkably animated. There was a group of shabbily dressed men smoking and laughing in a corner, a scissors grinder with his wheel, two guardsmen who were flirting with a nurse girl, and several well-dressed young men who were lounging up and down with cigars in their mouth. You see, remarked Holmes as we paced to and fro in front of the house, this marriage rather simplifies matter. The photograph has become a double-edged weapon now. The chances are that she would be adverse to it being seen by Mr. Godfrey Norton, as our client is to its coming to the eyes of his princess. Now the question is, where are we to find the photograph? Where indeed? It is unlike, most unlikely that she carries it about with her. It is cabinet size, too large for easily, conce easily concealment about a woman's dress. She knows that the king is capable of having her way laid in search. Two attempts of the sort have already been made. She may take it then that she does not, we may take it then that she does not carry it about with her. But where then? Her banker or her lawyer? There is that double possibility, but I'm inclined to think neither. Women are naturally secretive and they like to do their own secreting. Why should she hand it over to someone else? She could trust her own guardianship, but she could not tell what indirect or political influence might be brought to bear upon a businessman. Besides, remember that she had, had resolved to use it within a few days. It must be where she can lay her hands upon it. It must be in her own house. But it has twice been burgled. Psh, ah, they don't know how to look. But how will you look? I will not look. What then? I will get her to show me. But she will refuse. Oh, she will not be able to. But I hear the rumble of the wheel. It is her carriage. Now, carry out my orders to the letter. As he spoke, the gleam of the side lights of the carriage came round the curve on the avenue. It was a smart little landau which randled up to the doors of Brioni Lodge. As it pulled up, one of the loafing men at the corner dashed forward to open the door in hopes of earning a copper, but was elbowed out by another loafer who had rushed up with the same intention. A fierce quarrel broke out, which was increased by the two guardsmen who took sides with one of the loungers, and by the scissor grinder who was equally hot upon the other side. A blow was struck, and in an instant the lady, who had stepped from her carriage, was the centre of a little knot of flushing and struggling men who struck savagely at each other with their fists and sticks. Holmes dashed into the crown to protect the lady. But just as he reached her, he gave a cry and dropped to the ground, with the blood running freely down his face. At his fall, the guardsmen took to their heels in one direction and the loungers in the other, while a number of better-dressed people who had watched the scuffle without taking part in it crowded in to help the lady and to attend to the injured man. Irene Adler, as I will still call her, had hurried up the steps, but she stood at the top with her superb figure outlined against the lights of the hall, looking back into the street. Is the poor gentleman much hurt? she asked. He is dead, cried several voices. No, no, there's life in him, shouted another. But he'll be gone before you can get, you can get him to the hospital. Oh, he's a brave fellow, said the woman. They would have had the lady's purse and watch it if it hadn't been for him. They were a gang and a rough one too. Ah, he's breathing now. Oh, he can't lie in the street. May we bring him in, Mum? Surely, bring him into the sitting room. There is a comfortable sofa. This way, please. Slowly and solemnly, he was borne into Brioni Lodge and laid out in the principal room, while I still observed the proceedings from my post by the window. The lamps had been lit, but the blinds had not been drawn, so I could see Holmes as he laid upon the couch. I do not know whether he seized with compunction at that moment for the part he was playing, but I know that I never felt more heartily ashamed of myself in my life than when I saw that beautiful creature against whom I was conspiring, or the grace and kindness in which she waited upon the injured man. And yet it would be the blackest treachery to Holmes to draw back now from the part which he had entrusted to me. I hardened my heart and took the smoke rocket from under my ulster. After that, I thought we are not injuring her. We are but preventing her from injuring another. Holmes had sat up on the couch and I saw him motion like a man who is in want of air. A maid rushed across and threw open the window. 
At the same instant I saw him raise his hand, and at the signal I tossed my rocket into the room with a crowd of cry of fire. The word was no sooner out of my mouth than the whole crowd of spectators, well dressed and ill, gentlemen, oysters, ostlers, and servant maids, joined in a general shriek of fire. Thick clouds of smoke curled into the room, and out of the open window I caught a glimpse of rushing figures, and at a moment later the voice of Holmes from within, assuring them that it was a false alarm. Slipping through the shouted, shouting crowd, I made my way to the corner of the street, and in ten minutes was rejoiced to find my friend's arm in mine, and to get away from the scene of the uproar. We walked swiftly and in silence for some minutes, but until we had turned down one of the quiet streets which led towards Edgewood Road. Oh, you did very nicely, doctor, he remarked. Nothing could have been better. It is all right. So you have the photograph? Oh, I know where it is. And how did you find out? She showed me, as I told you she would. I'm still in the dark. I do not wish to make a mystery, he said, laughing. The matter was perfectly simple. You, of course, saw that everyone in the street was an accomplice. They were all engaged for the evening. Well, I guessed as much. Then, when the row broke out, I had a little moist red paint in the palm of my hand. I rushed forward, fell down, clapped my hand to my face, oh, and became a piteous spectacle. It's an old trick. Well, that also I could fathom. Then they carried me in. She was bound to have me in. What else could she do? And into her sitting room, which was the very room which I suspected. It lay between that and her bedroom, and I was determined to see which. They laid me on a couch. I motioned for air, and they were compelled to open the window. And you had your chance. Well, how did that help you? It was all important. When a woman thinks that her house is on fire, her instinct is to once, at once, once to rush to the thing which she values most. It is a perfectly overpowering instinct, and I have more than once taken advantage of it. In the case of the Darlington substitute scandal, it was a use to me, and also in the Arnsworth Castle business. A married woman grabs at her baby. An unmarried one reaches for her jewel box. Now it was clear to me that Our Lady of today had nothing in the house more precious to her than what we are in quest of. She would <laughs> rush to secure it. The alarm of fire was admirably done. The smoke and shouting was enough to shake nerves of steel. She responded beautifully. The photograph is in a recess behind a sliding panel just above the right pull bell, her bell pull. She was there in an instant, and I caught a glimpse of it as she half drew it out. When I cried out that it was a false alarm, she replaced it, glanced at the rocket, rushed from the room, and I've not seen her since. I rose and, making my excuse, escaped from the house. I hesitated whether to attempt to secure the photograph at once, but the coachman had come in, as, and as he was watching me narrowly, it seemed safer to wait. A little over pre precipitance may ruin all. And now, I asked, our quest is practically finished. I shall call with the king tomorrow and with you, and if you care to come with us. We will be shown into the sitting room to wait for the lady, but it is probable that when she comes she may find neither us nor the photograph. It might be a satisfaction to his majesty to regain it with his own hands. And when will you call? At eight in the morning. She will not be up, so that we shall have a clear field. Besides, we must be prompt, for this marriage may mean a complete change in her life and habits. I must wire to the king without delay. We had reached Baker Street and had stopped at the door. He was searching his pockets for the key, when someone passing said, Good night, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. There were several people on the pavement at the time, but the greeting appeared to come from a slim youth in an ulster who was hurrying by. I've heard that voice before, said Holmes, staring down the dimly lit street. Now, I wonder who the deuce that could have been. And that is the end of part four. Tune in tomorrow for the final chapter.